So yeah, sorry people on the video, um, but basically we've just been talking about rehashing. So uh, are there any questions about why we want to rehash or kind of the algorithm for doing it? Or are you ready to start coding? Yeah. Yeah, so the load factor is just a number that represents the average length of the linked list in your hash map. So it's the number of elements in your hash table divided by the number of buckets, right? So it'd be the average number of elements per bucket, and we want that average number to be small so that you don't have to iterate through like a really large linked list because we want, we're trying to get O of 1, constant runtime. So we want these, you know, we kind of want these linked lists to on average be very, very small, like only a couple of elements. So the question is, is it total number of elements or number of elements in each index? Generally, we use total number of elements um, just because it's, so we assume, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but we assume that our hash function does a good job distributing the elements across all of the buckets. So we would assume that our hash function wouldn't just put everything into bucket zero. So that, it's a pretty safe assumption that you'll have kind of the same number across all of the buckets. And it might be a little bit off, but it won't be too off. Great questions. Okay, so um, let's talk about how we would implement rehash. So, okay, um, I included some starter code that's just iterating through the um, iterating through our hash map, right? So, um, generally, when we want to grow the array. Or we double it just because that's kind of an easy number to get. So okay, you can say like int old or sorry, hash node star um, old table equals hash table. We kind of want to copy all of this stuff over so that we have it for the future, right? So if we double our capacity, um, then we want to create a new hash table, right? So how do we do that? Yeah, does anybody remember kind of how, like, what the what our hash table type is? It's an array of what? Yeah, hash pointers to hash nodes. Okay, so then we would put in capacity because we want that many buckets. Um, and you put the parentheses so that everything ends up being null. Okay. So, okay. Um, now down here, table. Right. so down here, okay, we have our current element. We want to put it into our new hash table. How do we know which bucket to put it into? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so we have like our, we have to get the hash value and then modify our capacity. So we can call hash code. You'd say like okay, um, so hash equals hash code of cur data. Okay, so um, we want to put it at the front of our hash table, right? Just like when we did add. People kind of remembering from Friday. This is making more coming back. So you'd say hash. So you'd say. Um, next equals um, full hash table of hash, right? And then we'd say hash table hash equals curve, right? So inserting it into the front of our bucket. Okay. So now we want to get to the next element in our old hash table. So usually we would do like cur equals cur next. All right, but what's the problem with doing that here? Yeah? Um, sorry, sorry, I didn't. So it could be that there isn't a next one, but we can catch that up here. Right? What is the value of cur next at this point? We did this. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we basically have lost like the rest of our original list. So we have to make sure that we save that. Next equals cur. Next. And then down here we can just say cur equals next. Right? Anything else that we have to do in this function? enough memory or are we doing everything that we need to do with our memory or are, are all our variables correct yeah yeah exactly so basically every time you call new you want there to be a corresponding delete so we would say delete of, of uh, old table great okay so we can try running this. Okay. Okay, so we can add. Our add is still working. Okay, our load factor is getting pretty high, right? They're, our linked lists are pretty long. So we aren't actually calling rehash anywhere. Where do you think we should be calling it? Yeah. Yeah, so you always want to check at the end of your add method to make sure that you haven't, uh, that you don't need to rehash. So kind of, we have a helpful function for the load factor. So we can say if this is greater than the max load factor, um, then we want to rehash. Okay. See, okay, and now we jump to twice the size, and we had to move all the elements over. We can keep doing that. See, and we jump again. What questions do you have about rehashing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the question is, why do we uh, why do we want to rehash so frequently? Um, so first off, I started off with a really small number of buckets. So this was a little bit disingenuous. I was doing that just so we could see the rehash happen multiple times. Another, uh, but I think also your question is, why do we choose such a low number of elements? And that's because you want even you know kind of the biggest buckets to still have a very small number of elements. So. You can kind of think if you were just to you know, not use a hash function and randomly assign numbers, like bucket numbers, to all of your elements, you would have some buckets are going to be longer than others. So you want even like the longer buckets to kind of have this upper bound of only having a couple elements. So that's why we choose such a small load factor. Another answer is that it's more important that contains is fast than that adds is, that then that add is fast, right? And this is still um, like it's kind of like vector where you know, doubling the size of the array isn't that costly, um, right? Because you aren't doing it that frequently. So, sort of a multitude of reasons. Cool, yeah. Like, when we did priority queue, we could just call delete and then brackets for a whole array structure, but when we had a linked list, we couldn't do that. We had to, like, go through and, like, replace the data and compile it. Yep. So when we're clearing up the memory of the rehash function, how does it know So the question is when you, um, like for priority queue, we called delete with the brackets on the array and that was totally fine. But when we had the linked list priority queue, you had to actually delete all of the nodes. Hopefully this isn't a surprise to anybody. Um, and then, so why is this that we're just deleting the array down here instead of like also going through and deleting all the linked nodes? So yes, if you were actually trying to delete the entire structure, you would have to delete the nodes. But these nodes still exist in our new hash table. So we don't want to delete the nodes because we still want like the same elements in our new, in our bigger hash table. So that's why we aren't doing that. The better question is why aren't we doing it up here? And I think that's because Marty just has a, uh, this is the starter code from Friday's lecture. And I think Marty just uh, 
wanted to, he made a note that you should do this. So it's pretty easy to extend to do that and definitely a good thing to do if you're implementing this in real life. Yeah, way up in the back. Great, so the question is, why is there this distinction between the number of elements in your hash map and then the, the number of buckets in the hash map? So you need to know the number of buckets because that's used in the um, hash code function, right? It returns the hash modded by the number of buckets. And then you need to know the number of elements if you want to do size or um, like if you want to do a rehash sort of thing. So the number of, the number of buckets tells you is really important because it tells you kind of where to look in the array, and the number of elements is more of a property of that particular set. Does that make sense? Yeah, buckets are indices, exactly. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So it's also sort of like how you had a size and capacity for um, the vector PQ or the array PQ. The code or the slides? Okay. Here. Right, so you're right that everything in the hash table is a null pointer, but we're getting curve from the old table, and we're kind of iterating through our old table. So old table should not hopefully have everything all be null. Cool. Okay, so in the interest of time, if there are more questions, um, why don't you come up and talk to me after class, but just to make sure we get through all the material. But these are really, really good questions. So, okay. okay. Um, so you might be wondering, this is a hash set. What do we do about hash maps? It's very similar to the BST lecture where we talked about how you could use a BST for a set and a BST for a map in that you would just, you know, you want to have uh, change your hash node to have two, to have like a key and a value field instead of just that data field, right? Because you need to store both pieces of information. Um, and then the idea is some of the function names are a little bit different, like you would have to implement a contains function, or so you still have contains, but now it's contains key. Um, instead of having add, you would have put, you know, get, which would return the value, so you'd have to search your hash map for the key and then get the value from that node. But generally, pretty similar. Um, one of the big differences is that when you put something in, you have to check to see if it's already in your hash map. And it's not like before where when we added something to our set, we just you know, ignored a duplicate add. Here we would have to actually change the value if there was already that key. So for example, if we were to put you know, this value and change it out to be Chris, then we would want to get rid of Marty here and replace him with Chris, like that. Yeah, is that a question? So this then leads to the obvious question of this was a table of IDs to names, which isn't super useful. It could be useful. But what if you wanted to have names to IDs or something like that? So let's talk about maybe how we could hash a string. So with an integer, it was pretty easy because you could just do something like take the absolute value and mod it by the length of your, uh, of your hash table. But with a string, there's not really like a number equivalent of a string. And hashing really requires this number so that you know which index to look at. Right? So now you might be saying, like, well, does it matter? Could I just like arbitrarily choose a number? You know, could I, how do I find a number? Can I just say they're all 42? So we'll, uh, let's talk about what makes a good hash function, and then we can try to think of some good hash functions for strings. So the most important property of a hash code is that it has to be consistent. So if you have two things that are the same, they need to have the same hash value, right? So why do you think that is? Yeah. So it's putting the same set down, hashing two things that are the same, so try and get two different strings of one. So then it's trying to hook up two different things, and if they just go off, then it's just like not consistent. 
Yeah, exactly. So uh, basically, if you were to have the if you were to hash the element the first time when you're adding it and you put it in that index, and then when you're searching for it later on, it and your hash function returns a different index, then you aren't going to be able to find your element in your hash table. So you're just going to say it's not there, even if it is. Right. So basically, our hash set would be useless at that point. Okay. Um, Another kind of caveat to this is it doesn't necessarily need to be the exact same object. They just need to, if it like is equal under some notion of equality, right? So these are two different vectors, but by the end of these three lines of code, they have the same elements in them. So even though they're two separate vectors, since they would be considered equal, like if you were to call v1 equals equals v2, it would return true, the hash codes for those have to be the same, right? Kind of for the same reason. We want any time we're looking for a vector with the elements 1 and 3 to be directed to the same index. Okay. Um, so why is it that, so we said that if A equals B, that they have to have the same hash code. But why is it that if A doesn't equal B, that they could still have the same hash code? Yeah, so basically, um, you're exactly right. So basically, there are infinitely many strings, right? There are only like 4 billion integers. So you're going to have to have two strings that have the same number because you can't like uniquely assign infinitely many strings to 4 billion numbers, right? So you just, that's why we had collisions before. And it's okay for a hash function to have collisions because really it's unavoidable. So, okay. So those... So what we just talked about is something a hash code has to have because if it doesn't have that consistency, it's not going to work. You just Your hash set won't be able to find the elements that you put in. A desired quality, it's not strictly necessary, but a desired quality is that the hash values be well distributed so that you know when you are mapping or when you are coming up with a hash function for all the strings, you kind of try to use all of these 4 billion numbers, not just 10 of them, for example. So why do we want this property? Why is this important? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So if you have a better distributed hash function, you're going to have better spread between all of the buckets. So the actual length of your linked list is going to be very close to the load factor. And we said our load factor is small, so it works out really well. However, if you were to have a poorly distributed hash function, like you know, in an extreme example, you could just end up with you have a linked list like a single linked list with all your elements. So it doesn't matter how big your array is, you would still have everything in the same bucket, and that's not going to be an O of 1 runtime, right? Cool. So keeping that in mind, so a valid hash function has to have that consistency, and a good hash function has to be, uh, has to be well distributed and also consistent because you can't have like a good but invalid hash function, right? Um, what do what do you all think of this hash function? How many people think that it's valid? Okay, how many people think it's not valid? Okay, how many people think so? It is valid because when you put in the same string, you're going to get out the same number because every string gives you the number 42. Right, so it is valid because you will be looking in the correct bucket. However, is this a good hash function? How many people think yes? How many people think no? Yeah, this will be the linked list example. So this is a really hard way to implement a linked list, right? Um, yeah, so this one would be valid but not good. Okay, what about this one? So where we just randomly assign an integer. How many people think that this is valid? How many people think it's not valid? Yeah, exactly. So this one's not valid because you would get two different random integers by put, when you put in the same string. Okay. Um, what about this one where we uh, put in the memory, we you know return the memory address of the string, which is a number, right? So how many people think this is valid? 
How many people think this is invalid? Yes, yeah, so this one's a little bit harder because you could have two strings um, you know, in your main function that are the same, like they both are hi dude, but they're at different memory addresses because they're different variables. So yeah, that in this case, this would be an invalid hash function. Okay, what about this one? Um, how many people think this is a valid hash function? Just use the length of the string. Okay, yeah, you're exactly right, because if your string length doesn't change, you're going to get the same bucket. How many people think this is a good hash function? Yeah, this is like kind of meh, right? It's better than always returning 42, but if we were trying to hash all of the words in the dictionary, there aren't that many different lengths of words in the dictionary, right? So even if we were to have an array of size 100, you, know, you aren't really going to get uh, elements in you know, the 99th and 100th buckets because the English language doesn't have words of that length. So better than 42, I would say still not great. What about this one? So this one is let's just return the value of the first character of our string. So how many people think this is valid? Yep, first characters. Two strings are the same. They have to have the same first characters. What about this one? Do you think this one is a good hash function? Do you think it's better than the previous one? How many people think it's better than the previous one? How many people think it's worse? How many people think that it, this is still like kind of mad? We can definitely do better. Yeah, good intuition. Um, so this one I would say is better just because, you know, if you're hashing all of the words in the dictionary, that gives you 26 options which, yes, there aren't a lot of words that start with X, but there are probably more words that start with X than have length 26, for example, right? Cool. Um, okay, so let's try to do a little bit better. Let's, why don't we just add up all of the word, or all of the characters in the string and return that number, right? So this is sort of a hybrid of the last two. So is this valid? Yeah, okay, is this good? Better than the last one? Okay. Um, so what sort of things are going to have collisions in this hash function? Yeah. Exactly. So words that are anagrams are going to end up hashing to the same bucket. So probably still not great. Definitely improvement over the last two because you're getting a wider range of values and you're probably getting a little bit of a better distribution. Um, so this is another lecture. Chris Peach did a simulation with um, a bunch of article titles from Wikipedia and he hashed all of them using that hash function we just saw. And so it's a little bit, um, like it might be a little bit confusing, but essentially red means that these buckets are really, really long. White means that the buckets are empty. And we represent this as a window instead of as a line because there are so many um, hash buckets, right, 50,000. So basically, anytime you see white, it's an empty bucket. And anytime you see red, it's a really, really full bucket. So this isn't super well distributed, right? There's a lot of white. So OK. What if we try to solve that anagrams problem and also try to get this, a better distribution to fill in some of this white? by having this weighted sum. So the idea is, okay, let's um, have each position of the string, uh, the, that character value multiplied by a power of a prime number, just to kind of get better distribution. So the idea would be, uh, you know, the zeroth index is just itself, and then the first index is uh, it, it, the character multiplied by 31, and the second index is like itself multiplied by 31 squared, and so on just to get a better distribution. Does that make sense? Kind of what we're doing here? Okay. So, oh, and we also want to be prime, just um, in general hashing works better with prime numbers. So um, if we were to just, this is actually what's used in Java is this hash function for strings. So it starts off with just this like random uh, kind of big number just to also increase the spread so it doesn't all start off at zero and um, kind of returns like that power structure that we had. So you can still have some collisions like these two would happen to collide, 
but it's better than before where all the anagrams collided, right? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, okay, this function is going to return a huge number. So where does that modding take place? And basically, um, a good way to think about hash functions, you want them to work on any number of buckets. So, hash fun so a good hash function should really return the entire range of 4 billion integers. And then it's up to the user of that hash function to modify the number of buckets. Because if we assumed an upper bound of like 17, for example, then when we wanted to rehash to 34, we aren't going to be like we aren't going to get the benefits of rehashing. So yeah, the basically the hash fun the modding part comes in at the point you're using the hash function, not when you're writing the hash function. Great question. Yeah. Uh, so the list returns our values, mm -hmm. and the hash is the last paragraph. Is this just the function table parameter? Um. Yeah. Yeah. This should be or. Er, no, because, okay, so hash originally is 5381, and then 31 times 5381 plus, like, yeah. So it wouldn't really have a plus equals because it's sort of included here. But, yeah. Cool. Yes? Yeah, so it has to do with how ASCII is, um, like, the ASCII values of these characters. Basically, F is one bigger than E, and capital B is 30 away from A. So it, like you end up with, if you were to actually try to decode this into the ASCII values, which I don't know offhand, but something like A is 97, B is 98, and like uppercase numbers are something different, um, or uppercase letters, sorry. So if you were to actually decode this, it has to do with how far away these letters are from each other. Cool. Do you have a second question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so it has to do with, I think these slides are like kind of, I think this is the opposite of this, but the idea is uh, like the zero character would be m multiplied by hash 31 times the length of the string, or like 31 to the power of the length of the string number of times, right? Because you're multiplying, that's how many times you'd end up multiplying hash by 31. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. But, okay, the super nitty-gritty details of how this works is not super important. Like, you won't be asked to you know, develop a really good string hashing function probably ever in your life. Um, that's not really how, like at this point we've just found good hashing functions and we continue using them. Um, if you want to go really, really deep into security or cryptography, that sort of thing, maybe you would. But in general, computer scientists don't develop new hash functions. It's just important to understand like why this one distributes um, the values well. Okay. Um, S dot length is technically, it's called, it's like an unsigned integer because it can't ever be negative. And so if you compare an int to an unsigned int, you sometimes get like a compiler warning. So I think that's why. This is, so I think literally this was like copied and pasted from the Java source code. So they don't want to have compiler warnings in the, in the Java source code. But yeah, it, it is an int, it's just like a special unsigned int. So it can't have a negative value. So if you compare like negative one to something that can't take a negative value, there's like some weird stuff that goes on. Cool. Okay, cool. Um, so this was our original. This is with the new hash function, right? So like blue is really good because that's buckets of size one to two. So you have a very good spread. There's a lot less white, there's a lot less red. So our average bucket size is a lot smaller. Cool. What questions do you have about identifying if a hash function is good or valid, um, that sort of thing?
Um, so that's a great question of like, how do you know if a hash function is well distributed? So actually one of the things that people uh, do is they, you know, just create, they run simulations to see, you know, on this sort of data that I want to use this hash function for, is there a pretty good balance? Right, so the hash function that Facebook uses for creating a you know, hash map of names or something might be different than the hash function that might be used to um, like show Wikipedia articles because those are two different kinds of strings. So there is, you know, there is some guesswork involved. There is running simulations. Generally, like it's hard to say this is the optimal hash function, but you should be able to kind of get a feel for if you were to compare these two hash functions, which one is going to get a better distribution? Great questions. Okay. So where this comes into play for you, because I already told you you will likely in your life never have to write your own hash function for strings, is you will have to write a hash function for objects that you create. So if you were to just create um, like something called a point, and you try to put your point into a hash set, the hash set's going to be like, I don't know how to hash your point, so I give up um, and, throw, and give you an error, right? Just because there's no hash of point. So in order to fix this, you would have to write your own hash code function and an equals operator. Uh, so the equals operator, just if the two objects are considered equal to in your eye, like in your eyes as the designer of that class, then you'd return true. So in this case, two points are equal if their x coordinates match and their y coordinates match. Though you can think there might be different um, requirements. And then uh, you can also look at with the hash code, you have to think about how can I really combine these parts in my class. So generally, we have good hash functions for the basic types like ints or strings. And so you would need to come up with some way to like weight those or balance those or add those parts together to make your own hash function. And that's kind of what happens. So in this case, we're just like multiplying by two different numbers to get a better spread. Cool. It's actually kind of similar to our final version of our string hash function where we were weighting all those characters differently. Okay. So in summary, uh, we have gone through a lot of different implementations of a set, and we have found one that is O of 1 across the board, which I feel like is a really, really cool part of computer science. Like, the fact that we can do this is amazing. And because of this, there are other really cool things you can do in computer science that like, we would not have been able to do if you didn't have these constant time guarantees on this data structure. Yeah, it's actually, there's a joke where if you're in an interview, um, like a software engineering interview, and somebody asks you, you know, oh, how can you do, you know, tr solve this problem? If you have no idea, just say hashing, and you're probably right. <laughs> so, yeah, because it's, like, it's that good. So many things in computer science just come down to, if you hash things, then, like, suddenly your problem is so much easier, and you can do it so much more quickly. Okay. So hashing is important in computer science because it's good for tech interviews and it's good for hash sets. But it's also really important for cryptography. Um, and kind of I, the idea behind this at like a very high level is if you wanted to store a list of passwords, you could store it like this, right? But then anybody who looks over your shoulder at your computer is going to see all of these passwords, right? And so, yeah. That's really bad because now all of you know my password and could log in as me, right? And then you reassign grades or whatever. Like that would not be a good system. So one idea is why don't we just kind of put this into code? And one way we can put it into code is we can hash it, right? It's because hashing will give us this kind of random looking number. There's not really a lot of um, intuition between why this number came from password one, two, three. And it's hard for somebody to go back and figure out what that number originally was. There are some caveats with this, which is your hash function, it's not enough just to be valid and well distributed, right? You also wanna have, generally they don't just make it four billion, 
they make it like some huge number because you really want to avoid collisions, right? Because you could sit, like if eve is great and password one, two, three hash to the same value in your hash function, then you're gonna end up with like Marty could accidentally log in as me, right? So you don't want people to be able to kind of like guess passwords randomly and then get into your account. So we really want to as close as possible minimize the number of collisions so that these hash functions or these hash codes really are unique for the password. The other tricky part is that we want this to be what's called a one-way hash function, which basically means uh, that looking at this number, it's not easy to figure out what the value, like the original value was. So our int hash function was you take the number and you mod it by 10, or like you, or sorry, it was the absolute value of the number, right? So I could take, like if I were to look at the hash function, which is the absolute value of the number, I can pretty easily figure out what your password was, right? Like there are two options. There's the number and the negative number, right? Um, so we want to create this, uh, what's called a one-way hash. There are examples of this. SHA-256 is what's generally used. Um, again, you will probably not, like this is just, if you are doing something that requires passwords, people just use SHA-256. They don't write their own hash function. What questions do you have about how hashing is used in cryptography? Yeah. Um, so the question is like, if you use SHA-256, couldn't you figure out the password? So there are kind of a couple of different ways that you might attack and try to, like, try to figure out what the password is. Um, so one example is uh, like, okay, I could be just looking at a form like I've typed in your username and I just start with like A, B, C, D, right? And go down. So the problem is there are so many combinations of password or so many unique passwords that that would take it forever basically. Um, so what they do instead, what uh, like hackers usually do instead is they would get like a large number of passwords. Um, and so these passwords are all hashed, but if you can like, you know, try you get access to the hash function, you try running like the word password through it. And then if that matches a bunch of different users in that file, then you know like, okay, that their passwords must be password and so on. So that's called a dictionary attack and that's kind of the more common way. You can't, if I were to just give you a random two, SHA-256, there's not a way to like reverse engineer what the password originally was besides just trying all the different combinations. Great question, yeah. The question is how hard is it for a hacker to get access to like this file? It's not that hard. Um, like it's something that should not happen, but something that does happen. So like, I've never done it, so I guess I can't really say how hard it is, but it is something that happens you know, every couple of months. Uh, there are also ways to prevent the, um, like what I was just talking about, the dictionary attack. If you, like basically you can combine, you can give every user like a number based on what number they were to um, sign up for your site. And then you kind of hash a combination of the number with their password so that you wouldn't be able to just try like password and get a whole bunch of hits. You'd have to try like password comma one, password comma two, right? So which would still take forever. Yeah, so like the LinkedIn password dump didn't do that. And like that was why that password dump was really bad if you heard about that from like 2012, I think, 2011. Kind of infamous. Always salt your passwords, kids. <laughs> yeah, it's called salting. Yeah. Okay. Um, I also wanted to, we have a little bit of time left over, so I want to talk about another um, way to set up your hash table. So as a fun fact that you can tell all of your friends, like something you learned today in CS106B, uh, there's a type of bird called a cuckoo bird that lays their eggs in other birds' nests. So they kind of kick out like the original birds and make these new parents, or like these parents of these birds care for their child. So this is relevant because it leads us to something called cuckoo hashing. So the idea behind cuckoo hashing is what if we made contains really, really fast? Like we guarantee that we only have to look in two places. 
Um, there's no linked list or anything like that. We just only are going to be looking at two values, max. Uh, so that so in order to do that, what we can do is we can have two different um, arrays, like two different hash tables, and have each one of them have a different hash function. And so we can try putting the element into like both of them, and then we just pick like an empty spot, right? And so we would, so when you're searching contains later on, you would only have to look at each of those two spots. The bad thing about this is add becomes a little bit harder because when you add, you might have to kick out an element that was already there and move it to the other hash table. So that's why it's called cuckoo hashing because it's kind of like what the birds do. So as an example, um, if we wanted to, so it's important that they have two different hash functions because if they were the same, then like something that collides will collide in both hash tables instead of just in one, right? So if these are two hash functions, um, when we insert three, we can just like randomly choose this to put in this array over this array. Uh, and this is nine mod four, which is one. So we put six, so that's 13 mod four, which is also one. Okay, um, five, so 15 mod four is three. Or 10 plus one is 11 mod four is three. Um, we insert seven. We So seven, so when we insert seven, you get 21 mod four is one, which we put in this spot. And uh, 15 mod four would put in this spot, right? So our issue with that is, okay, we'd have to kick one of these two out. So let's put seven in, we choose this one randomly, and then we would move five over to the other table. And so then this would be putting it in this spot, right? So add becomes a little bit longer because you could imagine like maybe there was something already in this spot and then you have to move that back over to this table and so on and so forth. But what's really cool is when you search for contains, you only have to look at these two spots. You don't have to look anywhere else. So contains is really, really fast because it maxes out at only looking at two elements. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is like, could you end up in this cycle where, you know, like we put five over here and then we kick like six over here and then, or, you know, like four over here and then we have to kick six over here and then three here and then seven. And now seven's going back where the five is. So like, could you just end up in this loop? And yes. So that's, with this one, the implementation's a little bit harder because you do have to track for those sort of loops. If that happens, you create like a new hash function basically for one of your two tables. Um, and then also you... Can, uh, you have to be really careful to make sure that you are rehashing when necessary because you can imagine if there's only one spot left in your table, you're going to have a really, really long add time. So, great question. The point, the point of this is to show you there are lots of ways to set up hash, to use hashing. So this is a little bit better when it, for, when it comes to contains, but a little bit worse when it comes to add. So um, there are lots of different ways that you can use hashing to make a hash set. We just gave you, a, we just told you about a really common one, and now cuckoo hashing. Cool. Any last questions about hashing? Anything we learned today? Okay. Have a great uh, rest of your Monday. <laughs>